It happens that our second reading is from the letter of James, which as it happens is one of my favorite books of the Bible. That's what marks me as a good Anglo-Catholic because it was Martin Luther's least favorite book of the Bible. He very seriously considered it leaving, out of his, leaving it out of his German translation, in fact, but ended up calling it an epistle of straw and leaving it in. So he had limits. And I can't let it go. This is, I believe, the last reading we would have from James, and we get it every three years, so I can't let it go. It is about pastoral ministry. You might not have noticed it, but it is. And I want to call your attention first off that it starts off with sort of a what different kinds of people can do. Like if you're suffering, pray. And if you're joyful, you can sing psalms of praise. And if you're sick, and then we're off on to another topic. So the first part, if you're suffering, pray. This is not advice to people who care for those who are suffering. That will come later. This is advice for those who are suffering. And it does not say, pray and do nothing else. But whatever else will depend upon what kind of suffering. If the suffering is from illness, perhaps pray and see a doctor. If the suffering is from economic oppression, perhaps pray and organize. Whatever the suffering is, sometimes it's just suffering. Sometimes we cannot get up any idea of what to do. There is nothing that comes to mind. But even then, pray. So it is, in fact, a good all-purpose advice to those who are suffering, even if it is not complete for many particular cases. Notice what it doesn't say. If you're suffering, reflect on how it might have been your fault. There's none of that. There's no invitation to consider whether or how you may have caused your own suffering. Sometimes people do cause their own suffering. Sometimes they don't. Pray. And pray for what? Pray for an end to suffering. It's really good for people who are interested in caring for those who are suffering to keep this in mind. That one of the things people who are suffering can do is pray, and therefore one of the things we can do is pray for and with them. We often perhaps forget this in our zeal to be active, go-getter, modern Americans who are going to make things happen. One of the biggest characteristics of suffering, in fact, its root in Latin and in Greek, is to be passive, to be undergoing to not be in control, to not get to decide what happens. That's not all there is to suffering, but that's part of what the word means. And in that lack of control and lack of ability, James's one simple sentence, let them pray, is very good advice. And what we can do when, those, when we see others suffering and we don't know what steps to take, well, we can pray. And even if we do know what steps to take, we can still pray and then do what seems needful. And those who are joyful, let them sing hymns of praise. Not just sing, not just sing happy songs, but sing hymns of praise which is to say, let them acknowledge before God where their joy comes from. Even if it doesn't feel like a religious joy at the moment, let them turn it to God. Take that joyful feeling we might feel with family, with success at work, with success in the world, and turn it to God in a song of praise. Praise the God who has made this joy come. 
Is there more to be done? Of course, but it will depend upon the particular joy. But the one thing that fits them all is to turn that joy to God in praise and thanksgiving for the God who made it available to us. And then we turn to the sick. The sick are also given instructions, and I want you to notice they're also on your bulletin. It, it says right here, and this is a command. It's a command from James. Like all commands, apply it with discretion, but we rarely apply it with the right discretion, which is you need to pick up the phone and let me read to you the command. If you or someone you know needs a pastoral visit in hospital or at home, please call or email Mark or Susie or Robert. And they're all here in this room and I bet they tell you they will be glad to get your call when you need a pastoral visit, either in hospital or at home. This is exactly what James, the brother of our Lord, says to do. If you are sick, call for the elders of the church. Well, there's three of them, and they will come, and they will pray with you, and they will lay hands on you, and they will anoint you with oil as you desire. And they will talk with you, and they will hear whatever you have to say. And they will be compassionate and kind. I know all three of them, and I trust that this is who they are. And we all have different personalities, and we want a different kind of word depending on how we feel. Well, there's three of them. You get your choice. He who could probably ask them all to come. <laughs> but that's an important thing to do. Because now that we get to a particular form of suffering, the suffering that is illness, we get a particular form of prayer, which is prayer from the elders which you can just fill in, those who one can trust to come and actually pray, actually pray, and lay hands on and anoint and be compassionate and kind. So you're not limited to those three, but you have to call someone, and it shouldn't be your family member. They're great too. But when we're sick, we can feel isolated from the community. See, that particular form of suffering comes with its own particular kind of isolation from those around us. Those who have acute conditions have felt this in one way, and those who have chronic conditions have felt it as well. Perhaps the people around you in daily life don't want to hear any more of what it feels like to have what a friend of mine calls chemo brain, a feeling of sluggishness that he now has after undergoing very heavy chemotherapy years ago. And I've seen him at work occasionally talk about having chemo brain and people's eyes roll. Oh, it's Frank. But for him, he's trying to make a connection in what is one of the dominant facts of his life now, is his struggle with cancer. And what goes for one colleague of mine with one illness goes for everybody who has been sick or is sick, whatever the illness is. And it differs, and we all have an experience, and it is suddenly the dominating fact of our lives. And the blessing of having Mark, Susie, Robert on call, and anyone else you can call, is that they will let you say what is hard about it right now. And perhaps one of the greatest blessings they can give, and those of us who are not on that list but occasionally see people who are sick and friendship or other things can keep in mind, is that they will not tell you how to make it better. I dare say none of these three leaders of our church, if you were depressed, would come to you and say, just smile. 
because they've learned, one way or another, that depression is not cured by just smile. And that in fact, what we most need at those times is often just what James says, a prayer, a hand on the shoulder, an ear to listen to whatever burdens us. It's the greatest gift one can give someone who is sick aside from healing. And if you're not a doctor and you're not a healer, a casual medical advisor is usually not what people need. But a hand on the shoulder and willingness to hear, that is. James uses these little bits of pastoral advice at the end of his letter and he concludes with a reflection on the, the power of prayer with the comment that the great prophet Elijah was just like one of us and he made the famine for three years. James has a conviction that prayer and especially the prayer of a righteous person can do a lot but it's not the prayer that does much of anything, is it? It's God. It's God who does amazing things. So what's the prayer for? Why do we pray for others at all? One way of getting an idea of what's going on there might be to think about the, the end of the story of Esther that we heard as well. Esther's people are under a ban. They're going to be slaughtered by a wicked plot from a jealous man who wants to get brownie points in the kingdom. And the king is a potentate who doesn't really know what's going on in his kingdom. And one of his many wives, has got, who happens to be a Jew, gets herself invited to speak, somewhat impetuously. Her willingness to speak up would have gotten her killed. That was a capital offense to speak to the king before being spoken to. So she has taken an awfully mighty risk. And she says, I have a request, king. What is it? Spare me and spare my people. What? What? <laughs> what's, what's going on? Why do I need to spare you and your people? That man, two seats down at this banquet, has a gallows ready to kill us. King says, well, I'm not going to let that happen. And as a good, solid, ancient Middle Eastern potentate, he proceeds to order the wicked man to be executed on his own gallows in a kind of Semitic version of karma. Esther is an intercessor for her people who prays to the great king who isn't really paying attention, don't you know what's going to happen? This is my last chance, O oh king. And he says, what? You need me. Here I am. Now, is God a foolish potentate who isn't paying attention? Nope but it can sure feel that way. It can sure feel that way. And when it feels that way, we can speak up. And we can speak up at great risk, as Esther did. This is why it's the prayer of the righteous person, not because God loves righteous people more, but because the righteous person knows that it's okay to raise your fist to God and scream, why is this happening? Do something about it. The righteous person, like Esther, has acquired a habit of courage in letting God know that God needs to get on the stick and do it. So getting the prayer of a righteous person is great. Getting the prayer of a bunch of unrighteous people who are willing to get their fists up in God's face and say, it's time, God, to act. That's what intercession is. 
It is not a lack of faith in God. It is not an accusation that God hasn't been paying attention. It is a cry from the heart of the reality of where life feels right now for me or for someone else for whom I pray. By the way, that's why the Psalms have some awfully nasty language in them sometimes. There's some prayers in the Psalms that are pretty much, God, please rain down fire on my enemies because, boy, they are putting it to me. And I know some people who find it very awkward and difficult to pray those Psalms because they think, well, we shouldn't be calling down fire on our enemies. But when you feel helpless, when you are at the end of your rope, sometimes that's the only prayer you have. So you cannot, as I have said before, you cannot stand with the poor unless you can raise your fist to God with the poor. And God, like a somewhat noble king, can take it. God is not obsessed with God's own ego. God does not get God's back up and say, how dare you? You can't speak to me like that. No, God is fine with it. There's only two ways to pray, ultimately. There's the first way, which is to try to be the, th the person you think God would like you to be. That's what Esther first does. She puts on her finest party dress and her best makeup because she thinks that's what she needs to do. But ultimately what matters for her and for the king of Persia was probably the tremble in her voice and the obvious honesty and despair with which she spoke. And this is what matters to God as well. So the one way to pray is to pretend to be who we think God would like us to be. And frankly, God doesn't hear those prayers because God only listens to the prayers of real people not imaginary people, not fictional characters, not made up people, but real people. The prayer God hears is the prayer that comes from an honest heart. Whether it's breaking or angry or doesn't believe or is really, really mad at that guy two seats down at the table. Pray in honesty. Then, then great things can happen.